um, harnessing any power against, I think actually Israel has the power over the United States. I think that's the problem. It's not the other way around. Um, there's just too much money coming in from the Israeli lobby, whether they be Americans, whether they be um, you know, American Christians or American Jews or whoever it is that is that is funding the support Israel at all costs, but they're just getting so much money from those political forces that I just don't see them shifting course at all. Do you think that that money, and th that money is powerful. I mean, um, the majority, what is it? It's like a lot of the money is coming from Christian Zionists, but we also have a lot of Jewish billionaires in this country. I think it's like 30% or something of the billionaires are Jewish and they're fund and they're putting pressure. That's a lot of money that these guys can't give up. And I mean, that's to me, it's the only explanation for their blind allegiance. It's not about morality. It's not about ethics. Everything would point to the opposite of that. It's instead just about, I don't want to lose my donors. I don't want to lose the funding. I don't want to piss off the billionaire class. So there's it's funny because I did I actually ended up writing my master's thesis specifically on the Israel lobby and the way it inf influences policy and I think it's a little multifaceted so there is mm -hmm. multiple levels to it one there's no question that the Christian evangelical base in the United States is very significant but it's primarily concentrated with influence in the Republican Party um, when George W Bush was demanding that the that Israel end its military operations in Janine back in 2002 when they were causing very significant civilian casualties, it was the Christian right that applied tremendous pressure on the Biden on, on the uh, Bush administration get, to get them to back down and leave Israel alone. And then you have another component, which is the military corporations. You know, U.S. military funding for Israel is effectively a gift back to U.S. military corporations because that's right. where Israel just spends all that money buying weapons from U.S. military corporations. So the military establishment is invested in a relationship with Israel in which Israel is dependent on U.S. weapons and constantly needs more and more of them. And then, of course, the last component is the APAC component and affiliated billionaires and donors and so on and their influence on policy. But what's most interesting in the research to me in the research that I've done on this is that you, when you look at the track record of confrontations between the Israel lobby and U.S. administrations, you begin to see a clear pattern. There are obviously endless examples, I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, of the Israel lobby pushing the administration to capitulate in the face of a confrontation with Israel. And we easily point at these and say, oh, look, it's an example. Clearly, the Israel lobby is in charge. But then you look at a different set of examples in which when Israel challenges real and deep strategic interests that are entrenched in the United States, they don't fare very well. When mm -hmm. Israel wanted to sell uh, missiles or no, one struck an economic deal with North Korea in exchange for North Korea agreeing to not sell uh, missiles to Iran and Syria. From Israel's perspective, that's a significant national security issue that we don't want new, uh, uh, large missiles from North Korea being sent to Iran and Syria. But the U.S. was so invested in isolating North Korea that they pushed Israel and forced Israel to cancel that economic agreement. And when Israel tried to sell t military technology to China, the U.S. also got extremely upset. I think it was in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, refused to meet with Israeli diplomats and Israel had to issue a public apology. And so you see that when you challenge real strategic interests in the U.S., the conversation does change. And the problem right now is on the question of Iran. If you were to dig a little bit deeper, obviously the strategic interest of the U.S. would be threatened by complete and total regional chaos. Um, but it's not in a very clear and surface level way that anybody is going to immediately raise their antennas. There's still a bit of ambiguity about what that would actually look like and how it might roll out in practice, um, that the this interest in continuing regional conflict that just keeps the money flowing to military corporations in the U.S. and that investment in militarism, um, it's a little bit more vague, so it's not clear how that's ultimately going to break. But certainly, if American policymakers are thinking more in a more focused way about what's good for the United States, it is absolutely to put an end to this insane slide towards regional catastrophe and to put an end to what Israel is doing. And not just in its confrontation with Iran, but putting an end to the onslaught and the slaughter they're committing in Gaza, because that is precisely the driving force that is pushing the entire region uh, towards the edge. So you think the real power is the military industrial complex? Absolutely. Yeah. 
and they're just wanting to continue funding. Because you're right, we give a lot of billions of dollars to Israel every year, but what do they do with those billions of dollars? They turn around and they spend it on U.S. weapons. I think that's actually the deal, right? Isn't that written into the contract? Like, look, we'll give you this, this money, but then you have to spend a certain percentage of it back on U.S. Uh, military weapons. Yeah. I don't remember what the percentage is, but certainly the overwhelming majority of it is specifically intended to be in the form of of weapons that American military corporations sell to Israel. So yeah. Right, right. So it is so it is that military industrial complex. They're 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 really the ultimate beneficiary of the arrangement and the relationship. Do you think that they have more power than the billionaire class, the APEC, like the money that is being then donated to all the politicians from APAC and not just from APAC? But why I bring up the 30% of the billionaires are Jewish is because they're then individually donating to other PACs. It's not it's not always so um, blatantly obvious. It's it, it, coming money coming from APAC is blatantly obvious, right? But there's money coming in from uh, dark money sources, I suppose, that also have a tinge of influence to them. You know, then you meet and you have dinner with this influential person. They say, by the way, this is my stance on this, 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 and this. And I hope you agree. <laughs> wink, wink. By the way, you know, my super PAC gave you a bunch of money. Um, so do you think that there's if all if the let's just say the politicians woke up one day and realized the military the greatest export of the United States being military industrial complex is not such a good idea that uh, they want to change course and do something different. Do you think there would be a significant amount of influence from the money from the lobby, the Israel lobby that would or do you think pe that the politicians would really be able to just replace that and say, well, we don't need it anymore? Yeah, look, I mean, there's no question that the Israel lobby is is influencing Amer I mean, certainly rhetoric, right? When Palestinians are the ones who are paying the price of Israeli policy, nobody cares about Palestinians in the U.S. No strategic interests give a crap about them, right? And so what you end up with is Israel clearly committing unjust atrocities against Palestinians and American politicians just parroting like broken robots. Yeah. Israel has the right to defend itself is all they have to comment on that. That is certainly the influence of the Israel lobby because nobody else is involved. And so in that sense, I think that the Israel lobby does have tremendous influence on the way that we have the conversation in the United States. Yeah. Um, and the media certainly follows the lead of politicians. If you have the entire political spectrum talking in a certain way about um, constantly portraying Israel as the good guys and everybody who opposes them as the bad guys, that gets embedded into media culture that always wants access to the American elite. And so they adopt the same framing um, and, and that becomes part of just essentially internalized part of Washington political establishment, both media and political and military conversations about these kinds of things. Um, but yes, it's it's ultimately, I don't think that American politicians, when push comes to shove and you are looking straight in the face of getting the United States involved in a potentially catastrophic war and fully understanding because i don't know do they even understand it you know we have constantly this sense that the people in charge are very knowledgeable and that we can cede the the policy making to them because they'll know where the line is that they'll pander but if we get too close to the line and and part of what happens you know i think is that you lose a little bit of confidence in the extent to which politicians really deeply understand the implications of their and the consequences of their actions that you might end up with a more core elite um, class within policymaking circles that has that deep appreciation. But the question is, can you rein in every you know random member of Congress from some town that depends entirely on donors and 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 uh, just engaging in this kind of inflammatory political rhetoric? You might not be able to rein all of them in, um, and that also becomes a question ultimately: is to what extent can you have an environment in which Congress is pandering and warmongering and demanding action on Iran while potentially tacitly giving Biden the wink of, no, of course, de-escalate. We know that's what's necessary. It's uh, hard to get a deep enough insight into how these things actually do play out in practice. Yeah, it's, it's going to be really tricky. The reason why I think this would, this would result in a wider war with other countries getting involved is because Israel has shown that it's Willing, I mean, with the strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria, why did they do it? They said, well, because Iran is funding Hezbollah, Iran is funding the Houthis, Iran is, fun you know, Iran is behind all of this. Well, the United States is behind Israel, right? So there could be an argument made by another country. I don't think that's how it would happen, though. I think that Israel would strike um, other countries saying, well, you're now funding Iran and you're the bad guy. And so now we're going to we're going to we're going to do something to sabotage 
you in some way going after Russia or maybe China or something in some way, because they, they clearly show that they're willing to, um, or even just do a false flag on the United States and say, well, you're not joining us on the ground. So we're going to, we're going to make you, you know, we're going to, we're going to do something that's going to bait you into this war because we know that's what ultimately gets you in. They know what got us into World War II, Pearl Harbor. That's the only way really to get us in. The way to get us in is to attack us, is to get us attacked. Maybe they would facilitate, I, I don't put it past them. I really don't put anything past them. They've shown that they're capable of absolutely anything, including genocide. Anybody that's willing, any, any regime that is capable of that is capable of anything. So I just don't put it past them. And I also don't put it past the media. That's, you know, I would agree with you that the sentiment is changing. And I think it would be very easy to change the sentiment of practically everybody in America towards the plight of the Palestinians of what's going on if the media changed. But the media is not changing. They're still, you know, they just, we're seeing slight changes. We are definitely seeing more showcasing of what's actually going on to the Palestinians than we've ever seen before, ever. But it's still, the rhetoric is still brainwashing. When I talk to a normal average American who's just reading news every day, but they're not like you and me really engaged in it all day, every day, they're still like, well, I support Israel. And then I, you know, why? Well, because, you know, those Palestinians are terrorists. I mean, they, they're still they're still just spewing the same brainwashing talking points that the media has been brainwashing them with for a really long time. And I don't know when we're going to change that money, that APAC money, that lobby money is really when they start going and infiltrate that the influence they have is really on that. Like you said, the brainwashing mess. Well, the, you say the mess. I say the brainwashing message. Right. It's on the brainwashing. And it works. So I, you know, I, I, um, Israel's nuts. They've shown that they're nuts, unfortunately. I don't know if it's the Netanyahu regime there. I don't know if it's just because the average Israeli still supports the war on Gaza. Even they just don't like Netanyahu. Yeah. Look, it, in terms of where Israeli society is, and it's, it's almost ironic that it is US provided impunity for Israel is what made Israel more and more extreme. Totally because extreme. When you allow a country like that to live with its boot on top of another people and constantly reinforcing the idea that this is legitimate and that you'll fund it forever and you'll protect them from any consequences forever, you end up feeding a sentiment that gets out of control, which is precisely where Israel is, where it's not about Netanyahu anymore. The truth is the entire political spectrum right now within Israel <coughs> With the exception of the marginal left and then of Palestinian citizens uh, in the Israeli parliament, those are the only people who are objecting. But beyond that, anybody who has the chance of being prime minister in Israel certainly supports, if not the same level of extremism in, in the massacre in Gaza, at least fundamentally the idea that Gaza cannot be free, that it must live forever under Israeli control. The more fundamental problem of not viewing Palestinians as equal human beings who are deserving of their own dignity and freedom and rights that would be equal to Israelis, that is very widespread in Israeli society and across the entire Israeli political establishment. So you're looking at people who believe they should either crush Palestinians with brutality versus control Palestinians in, more, in a more humane way. But that's the spectrum. And to go beyond that spectrum, to think that Palestinians can, should be free of Israeli control is not part of the political conversation. Right. So, and that's exclusively the result of the US ensuring that there are no consequences for what Israel is doing. Because every time Palestinians tried to negotiate for their freedom, the US applied its leverage exclusively on top of Palestinians and allowed Israel to do whatever it wants. And with that imbalance of power, Israel has no reason to quote unquote compromise. And here compromising simply means stop stealing Palestinian land and stop oppressing Palestinians. And then when they go to the UN, the US steps in and vetoes any UN resolution that's critical of Israel or trying to hold Israel accountable. For context, the US used its veto more than 50 times to shield Israel from accountability at the UN Security Council. For a perspective, that's more vetoes than cast by the entire other permanent members of the UN Security Council combined on all issues for that same period from the 1970s until today so we have this pathology of ensuring that Israel does not get held accountable. The same with the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court and the U.S. applying pressure on the ICC to make sure they don't investigate Israeli crimes. And you see it when Palestinians protest peacefully and Israel opens fire into a Palestinian crowd and murders them, that the U.S. describes this as legitimate self-defense. 
You see it here in the United States when people want to boycott Israel. Israel mm -hmm. calls it economic terrorism. And you have American politicians passing laws saying that you can be punished by your local or state government for the crime of boycotting a foreign country. Now, I just want you to reflect on how insane that is, because the right to boycott is fundamental to Americans. It's part of American culture. It is part of the Constitution. It's been defended by the U.S. Supreme Court. The founding of the United States started with the uh, uh, British tea boycott. The In the civil rights movement, we've had the Montgomery bus boycott. Those are foundational parts of American culture. And you have laws on the books in American states that say if you boycott Israel, or sometimes even worse ones, if you boycott Israeli settlements, which are war crimes, by the way, under international law, then you can lose contracts to be able to work with your local school or hospital or whatever. They, to get these job contracts, you have to certify that you don't boycott Israel or its settlements. Think about that for a moment. If you boycott a foreign country's war crimes, you can't get a particular kind of job. But if you boycott your fellow American business or state or whatever, then that's fine. That's just free speech. That's complete and total insanity. And it's just when you do provide that kind of climate in which nobody can question Israel anywhere, and you ensure there's no accountability for Israel on any level, domestically or internationally, you do feed that pathology where Israel does feel empowered because it's part of human nature that whenever you give one group of people power over another, mm -hmm. abuse is inevitable without accountability. And ensuring that there can never be accountability for Israel means that we've reached a level of abuse that is at genocidal proportions, literally right now, as we're watching it unfold. And it will take a shift in American policy for that to change or for Israel to get itself into a mess regionally that the U.S. can't get it out of which might be the consequence of this confrontation with Iran getting out of hand.